We've been chasing storms for a long time now, and we've never seen anything like this. So, if, if you can tell me without spoiling the film, because I haven't had a chance to see it, what what is Clownado? Well, uh, the, the original script we had around back in like 96, it was just called Clowns with a V. And um, it didn't have a tornado in it. It was just like this, like these clowns that were basically coming back. They were almost like zombie clowns because they were, this, this witch puts a spell on them and all this stuff and they come back. So I was, my, my buddy that I work with around the studio building where I'm at, um, He's like the maintenance guy, and he's also one of the managers of the building. And we were, you know, hanging out and talking and laughing because I just made a werewolf movie. And he said, "You need to make Wolf NATO because everything's NATO, and you'll, you know, you, you'll you'll cash in." And I'm like, "I don't really care if I cash in, but yeah, I get it. You know, it's it's funny." And then he, uh, a couple of days later, we're talking, and he's throwing out all these different NATOs, and he goes, "I'll tell you one, Clown NATO. There you go. Everyone's scared of both of those." And I said, "Holy crap, that kind of sounds cool." Um, not in any way was I trying to really cash in on Sharknado. So then I went back to the original script and I dusted it off and brought it out and I kind of rewrote the whole thing. And uh, so it's basically this, the same deal where it starts out with a kind of a love triangle, kind of a noir thing. And the the circus performers are even kind of stuck in a time warp where they still kind of talk like wise guys. It's pretty fun. Uh, Richard Woodmark was a big inspiration for Big Ronnie, the character. And uh, who's the bad, you know, owner of the circus and all this. And so these guys, you know, are nasty and he catches his girl in a love triangle and they end up killing her lover. And so they're going to basically torture her for the rest of the time by making her part of the show and throwing darts at her and all this bad stuff. And but it's kind of a twisted circus. It's not normal at all. And so she wants to get revenge. So she goes to the gypsy of the circus, who's also well-versed in black magic of course she is and she uh she basically uh puts a spell on these guys and she she warns though you know these things don't always work the way you want them to it could backfire and it could be really bad so i don't care you know we got to do something so she uh they do the spell and they're going to get wiped out by this storm but the storm ends up enveloping them and they end up becoming part of the storm and then they end up using the storm to get revenge and cruise around. They kind of use it like a Corvette. They just cruise from one spot to another in the storm, doing all kinds of destruction along the way. Um, some people were disappointed. They were like, man, we wanted to see clowns being thrown everywhere and like thrown through windshields and everything like Sharknado. And I'm like, yeah, but this isn't Sharknado. Um, it never was meant to be like that. And uh, I kind of like the idea of it being their motor transportation so they can create storms wherever they go and cause havoc and devastate this little town. And I kind of liked that angle. And that's kind of where we went with it. And so then through the course of the movie, um, they're trying to get this girl who his big Ronnie's girl uh, named Savannah and they uh, chase her through this town and she ends up pulling in other people, not even on purpose really. She just pulls them in and they start uh, having a, uh, uh, the job of trying to save the place you know they're trying to they're trying to kind of make sure that the, the town is saved and this thing doesn't go beyond the town and, and into the next town even and start decimating them so these, this little ragtag group is trying to save the day as far it's as kind the, of original yeah i got you <laughs> as far as the shooting locations was that was that out of practicality or was that is that how you envisioned it from the start um, the locations were, we kind of, you know, I just kind of wrote what I wrote and then we just had to find locations to match. A lot of times I will write to the locations I know I have at my fingertips. I'm like, oh, well, we've got these two buildings and they look like this. I can really do something with that. Let me write specifically for those locations. And, and that's, you know, a smart idea when you have zero budget. But <laughs> for this one, I just kind of wrote the script and I was like, let's just find the locations, man. And there's a couple times we had to kind of tone it down a little bit. Like we have a, an airport in this thing and we, you know, someone was thinking we did all that CGI, but that's all real. Um, <clears throat> we took over an airport for a couple of weekends and shot. So, I mean, that was all the real deal. Uh, how did, how did you cast this when you, when you're looking for people to play evil clowns? 
What was the casting call like? Well, that's a good thing. Is I've I've worked with a lot of these people before, and a couple of them I hadn't, but I knew them, and I'd I'd been friends with them, or I'd met them through different conventions or whatever, like Gene Silver, I, you know, Cinema Wasteland, and you know things like that. And I was like, you know, honestly, it it kind of was pretty easy to cast because I kind of knew. All right, you know, this, I had people in mind when I was writing that would be kind of perfect for it, and we did a casting call for some of the parts, but a lot of them I kind of had already talked to the people as I was kind of thinking of this whole story. And I was like, you know, I have you in mind for this. Would you be open? And uh, because I'd known them for a while and I'd seen them in other things or they'd already worked with me, it was pretty easy to, you know, kind of put those people in these parts, which made everything a lot better because I didn't have to like go crazy trying to figure out what I was going to do, which is a big part of the process is, you know, finding people that you think can fill these parts and, and kind of fulfill what you have in your mind. And for the most part, I think I did pretty well on it. You know, it, it's hard because sometimes you get reviews and people are just so mean to low budget films like this because, I mean, you're not, I mean, Gene Silver's been in movies since the seventies, you know, Linnea, Linnea Quigley, Eileen Dietz, they've all done a million movies, but like not everyone in the cast has done that. And, and they've done movies, but they're not, a-list stars or you know even b-list stars are just they're, they're doing the best they can mm -hmm. and um so you know people are, are really cruel about that sometimes but i'm like look you know it's not easy to do these things and the cast is under a lot of pressure so i think they did pretty well and i think the clowns were pitch perfect i, I was really really paying close attention to the clowns because they if they didn't work as the villains the movie wouldn't work at all um, so I really, really was pushing to, to make sure that my, my villains were, you know, amazing and that they were like the, you know, like the kind of villains that you would want to watch in a movie for an hour and a half. So that's the big thing. Cause you're going to be living with them for a while. So you want to make sure that people enjoy them for sure. Uh, how did you get, uh, Miss Quigley involved in this? So what, what role does she play in the movie? She actually plays the role of Spider, which is a character she played in Sorority Babes in the Slimeball Bolorama. And that's an homage to that film for two reasons. Number one, um, Lene and I have been friends for 25 years. Uh, we met a long time ago. Um, I would say we were more acquaintances back then, but over the years we've become friends. And it's because my mentor was David Dakota. And David Dakota really kind of took me under his wing when I was just starting out and helped me and gave us some legitimacy probably before we should have had it because uh, those early movies when I was a kid are terrible and you have to live those down. But um, because of that, I wanted Linnea to play that character because I wanted to pay homage to David and to kind of the era when I first met her. Um, Linnea was also in Bone Hill Road, which is a werewolf movie from a couple of years back. And she um, <clears throat> she's a good person and we kind of have a shorthand. We enjoy working together and she's right on the ball you know she comes in she knows what she's going to do and she has a really good time and she's really good to the rest of the cast and crew and everybody's just loves working with her you know she's done she does movies still all the time because that's what she you know she chooses to do and um it's it's one of those things where i needed someone that can run this bar and as i was writing i was like you know what would be kind of fun is to bring that character back and just have her be the bar owner instead of this burly guy it's going to be this burly girl who just doesn't take crap for anybody. And so that's where we decided to just go with that. Uh, one of the biggest things in cinema right now, even low budget cinema is quote unquote, uh, subverting expectations. Uh, does your, does your film attempt to subvert expectations in any way? I think we do only because it's, it's, I think people, it's either going to disappoint people or make them happy. And the reason <laughs> is because, like I said earlier, a lot of people are expecting this to be like Sharknado, and it's not. It's just simply not. It's um, it's a different kind of movie, and it's you know we we tried to kind of mix some styles, and like it's got that noir style because of the clowns and the the old school kind of way they do things and the wise guy club kind of attitude, and then it's got suddenly you're thrust into well this isn't back in the 30s or 40s at all. That opening scene is supposed to kind of take you by surprise, like what the hell is going on? It feels like we're in the 40s, and then suddenly. We're not. I mean, there's people cruising around in normal cars and everything because that's kind of one of the things we wanted to try to do is kind of throw in some, some different ideas. And I think it goes 
you know, some cool places. I know, you know, the, uh, the death scenes, we definitely took um, as much as we could and made them as crazy as possible, you know, on our budget and tried to make those as original as possible, do things that maybe you haven't seen every day. Um, one of the death scenes, and there's an homage to Mausoleum, one of my favorite movies with Bobby Breezy from, you know, the 80s. I just I love that kind of stuff. And so we did like an homage to that. <clears throat> but I, I've, you know, I've heard it's pretty original. A lot of people say, I've never seen a movie like this before. And really from the opening minute to the end, you really can't tell, I think, where it's going to go or what's going to happen. So I think that's, you know, that's something kind of good. I try to do that as much as I can. Sometimes you're hampered by the budget. But I remember with Dreaming Purple Neon, people were like, man, that movie was so crazy, Todd. I had no idea where the hell I was going to end up. It starts way over here and ends way over there, and you don't even know. You just go have to go along for the ride. And I also find that audiences today get kind of mad at that, though, because they want – you to fulfill their expectations so you're supposed to fulfill expectations for an unknown invisible audience that you don't really even know so you're like as a writer director producer whatever even the casting you know the crew you're you're working towards something that you feel is a story that you want to tell and then you get people all mad at you because it, you didn't go the direction they wanted you to and then you're like well God, you just gave me this horrible review or mean as hell to all of us for just because we didn't do what you wanted us to do. But why not just give us our own merits, like just enjoy it on its own merits. Just sit back and enjoy the ride and, you know, just just go with it because we're definitely not copying anything. I, I can honestly tell you when I when I write stuff, I'm not trying to copy anything. Um, well, to wrap this up, uh, let's um, – one of the questions I did have I can get to is out of – out of the entire film, is there a particular scene in the movie that you felt was your favorite? Gosh, there's some set pieces in there that I'm really proud of. Um, but, you know, it's just, I, I think the overall film, you know, turned out, I was honestly afraid we weren't going to be able to finish the movie. So I have mm -hmm. this, like, connection to the whole film. There were concessions made that drive me nuts to this day. Um, people don't understand that, but it was just so hard to finish this film. But we, I think overall, the whole fact that the film came out and seems to tell a story and seems to hold together is a really big deal for me. But I loved the opening scene where it was full on film noir when we did all this amazing lighting and, and John O'Hara and Rachel Loggins' performance. Um, Christopher Pryor was in there. He did great. These guys really had a handle on that particular mood. And I mean, I'd sent John home with a bunch of homework, watching Richard Woodmark and everything. And said, this is, you know, I want you to become that era. And he did. And his performance, this is before he became the clown was really amazing. And so I really do love that scene. That scene to me, that's, it's one of the scenes people complain about, which is funny. But I think technically it's a very sound scene and the acting is good and everything seems to fire. And that dialogue that people can't understand in this day and age was exactly what I wanted because I was paying homage to films that I personally love. Um, I'm a big film noir buff. And so I was really happy with the way that turned out. I really liked the scenes with Joel Weinkoop. He played uh, this you know, Memphis Hawk, this pilot who kind of comes in to save the day with the airplanes and all the airport stuff was really good. Those scenes all I was really happy with. And I was, there's a couple of scenes I was so happy with, but I can't tell you because I don't want to spoil it for the audience. Um, <laughs> gotcha. But there's a couple of effect scenes that turned out really good. I mean, just really popped. And then there's a scene where uh, Shrinky Dink, who's our small clown, is chasing people on his um he's got a motorized beer cooler and it's really it really belonged to the gentleman that played the part and uh and he had a way that he could hook another beer cooler to the back so a person could like drag more beer or i could sit on it or whatever and so i sat on there to film it man that thing was going it was getting up to like 35 miles an hour and 40 miles an hour and i was like i'm gonna fly off of this thing but uh that was fun, and the scene came out pretty good. I thought it was way over the top and a lot of fun, and so that that stuff, you know, there's there's a lot of things. I I have to give full credit to the cast and crew because we 
you know, you've heard of grueling shoots and you've heard of difficult things. And this movie was really tough. And there was some problems with the effects department. And sometimes I'd have to pay for effects three times. And there was one night on the set, and I'll make this quick. It's a true story. I kind of give you an idea why I feel this way. Um, <clears throat> got a tap on the shoulder. I'm like, okay, hey, what's going on? Uh, you know the prop list? Yeah, we don't have any of those props. Because the prop guy quit that day because his girlfriend didn't want him making movies anymore. Uh, so he just called us on the phone and said, yeah, I'm not going to be there. I, I have to quit. Okay, no props. So then, I'm like, great. So I'm still trying to set up the lighting and, you know, the crew and I are putting everything together, getting ready to shoot while it's daylight because it's going to be dark soon. Tap on the shoulder. Um, none of these effects are prepped. What? What, what do you mean? We've got like all these extras. We're supposed to kill tonight. We've got like this big slaughter scene, a mass slaughter scene. Got, I've got 30 people here to be killed. What do you mean? There's no, yeah, none of those effects are crap. They're, they just didn't get them done. Now, mind you, this was the end of July. My first meeting with the effects team was in February. Okay. That much time and nothing was prepped. So I was like, oh, Jesus. So then I was like, great. Then I get a tap on the shoulder. Hey, um, you know the, the guy that's the midget wrestling guy? Yeah, yeah. He's not going to make it. What do you mean he's not going to make it? He's, he's the centerpiece of the scene. What do you mean he's not going to make it? But he's in a different city doing some wrestling. He says he kind of forgot. Kind of forgot? What do you mean he kind of forgot? Yeah, he's not going to make it. I swear to God, this was happening. One, that's just one night on the set, and I'm going, and as a director, you're basically like a painter, and suddenly someone just took all of my paints away and the paintbrush. So I'm like standing there trying to figure out how I'm going to make this, because I can't just you know, turn around and send all these people home. Some of them have driven you know, an hour, two hours to be there. One guy drove five hours to be there because he wanted to be in the scene, and I'm like, I can't do that to these people and then expect them to come back. That's not fair. So I have to figure out how to save this on the spot. And so that kind of thing, you know, it, your entire head explodes and you feel like you don't. But, you know, I don't yell at anyone or anything. That's not my style. But I, people could tell I was definitely frustrated because I was just sitting over there trying to look at the script and figure out what the hell I was going to do. We, we went ahead and finished the lighting and everything. And then we just figured out how to save it the best we could. And that's why, you know, I kind of look at this and say, well, the whole movie kind of feels like an accomplishment because of things like that happening all the time. So it was, it was difficult. It was really difficult. And, and, and the cast and crew, they really pulled together and we all kept each other lifted up so we could make it through this thing. And the, the weather was god awful. It would storm literally every time. And you'd think, well, that'd be perfect, Todd, but it isn't because you can't film in it. So it's like, <laughs> well, you have to make the storm yourself because if you're trying to film in one, you're not going to get anything accomplished. So yeah, that's, that's my long drawn out answer. But the truth is, you know, all of these things are what makes me feel that way about the film that, you know, it's a miracle it ever got finished. And so I kind of hold the whole thing dear to my heart just because I feel like damn thing almost killed me. I'm glad it, I'm glad it made it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Todd. Well, your, your labor of love is currently available to stream on demand and will be available via DVD next week. So I, I really appreciate you putting all that effort into making sure that it did get out. I'm sure it'll be received very, very well. I mean, it's, it's got clowns. It's got a tornado that carries clowns around. It's got death. It's got, uh, it's got one of the greatest sque uh, scream queens to ever have graced the horror genre. So I don't see what's not to like. And uh, I, I thank you again very much for taking your time to talk with me at length about this. It is truly appreciated. Thank you, man. It's all, it's all about you know, the honor I have from you even asking me to be here. I, I really, it is, really is a big honor, and I really feel you know, blessed that you, you brought me on and, and we had this great conversation. It's been, it's been wonderful. I, I think you're, you're a great host, and, uh, and I hope to come back again someday. <laughs>